Welcome to Millennium Live, a leadership and discovery podcast. On episode 152, we're exploring some meaningful moments on 10 episodes that have had a big impact on our audience, and so we're throwing it back this week. We hope you enjoy this compilation from some of our distinguished guests and the stories that shaped their career. National Security Advisor to former President Barack Obama, co-chair of the National Security Action, and author of New York Times bestseller, The World As It Is. Here's a cool snippet from episode 50 that goes back to the early days of the Obama campaign, prepping for foreign policy debates, and his unique tenure through the entirety of the Obama administration, Ben Rhodes. Did you know much about then Senator Obama at the time? Did you know about what he had done in his life? Or did was it more so that you lined up a lot to kind of his policy positions? I didn't know him, obviously, personally. I had kind of followed his rise in 2004 that culminated in that speech at the Democratic Convention. And I was one of those people who was really struck by that speech and by his meteoric rise, in part because... I was very frustrated by politicians around that time. You know, it felt to me like this huge event that I witnessed 9-11 had happened. And then it seemed like we were getting a lot of stuff wrong, principally the Iraq war. And here's the one guy who's different. And he's not just different because he's African-American. He's different. He's speaking differently. He opposed the war. He seemed to represent a generational change. All of that appealed to me. And so it wasn't just I wanted to work for any campaign. I I very much wanted to work for his campaign. With the assumption that he was going to win the election, was it then your motivation to want to work in the administration? Yeah. And it's interesting. I never really thought about a job. But on the campaign, I was kind of a utility player because I was on the speech writing team and I wrote all the foreign policy speeches. And But I also was the guy who helped Obama prepare for debates on foreign policy and interviews on foreign policy. And I did some media. And, and so, you know, campaigns, everybody does a little bit of everything. Sure. They're very flat organizations which is a great way to pick up new skills. Um, so for me, this is all, you know, political communication beyond speech writing was new. And when we came into the administration, at the very beginning, I was a speech writer. But within eight months, a role opened up that essentially combined all of the things that I had done for him, which were not just speech writing, but his communications and his preparation and how's the government communicating on foreign policy and also, how are we making sure some of his priorities are not languishing, you know? And there was this deputy national security advisor role. So in, in, a, in a strange way, the role I performed on the campaign kind of evolved into the role I performed in government, which didn't fit that neatly on an organizational chart, but ended up being eight years of my life. And, and you were with the administration for all eight years, right? Yes, uh, which is very rare. <laughs> I was going to say, that's not, that's not the norm, No, right? people usually cycle. I used to, when I was a kid, I used to look at people who left White House jobs and think, how could anyone ever leave these jobs? Yeah, that's what I would think. They burn you out. I mean, they're intense. I mean, I think I could do the eight years because I was young. You know, I was um, 31 years old at the beginning of the Obama administration, and I didn't have kids yet. And um, I had a lot of stamina. And so most people, what they do is they do a few years at the White House and leave or they they move to an agency. You know, if it's foreign policy, go to the State Department, the Defense Department, where the hours are a little easier. You know, at the White House, what's different is every problem comes to your doorstep. You know, every crisis, you're going to be drinking from the fire hose. Like you don't get a break. The unsolvable stuff. Yeah, that stuff that comes to you is the stuff that has no easy solution and, and, and has bad options. And, and I even, you know, write in the book about like three years in a row, my vacation, the one vacation of the year was canceled because if there's a chemical weapons attack in Syria or mm. if ISIS beheads an American, like you drop whatever you're doing and you go back to work. And, and so, you know, I, I, there are very few people that were in the White House from day one until literally I left with the Obamas on their last flight on Air Force One on Trump's inauguration day. But what I liked about that is, you know, I saw the beginning, middle and end of this whole story. And I saw what it's like to come in and to exit. And that, that's a pretty rare opportunity in American politics. Younger Ben Rhodes. If Ben Rhodes of today was talking to younger Ben Rhodes now, elections won in 08, Hyde Park speech, you're getting ready to get into the administration official, uh, officially. What would, what, would, what would now Ben Rhodes say to younger Ben Rhodes to maybe help him better prepare or be less surprised of certain things? What, what, would he, what lessons would he want to tell the younger version? Yeah. It's a really great question. I think the couple of things that come to my mind are, are, first of all, you know, we came in, I mean, people forget, given how partisan things are now, 
Obama came in not just with a huge landslide victory, but with this kind of unifying message. We're going to come together to solve these problems. You know, we've got the financial crisis and we've got the Iraq war. And I definitely underestimated the kind of partisan buzzsaw that we were going to run right into. And I, would, um, I would guess Obama probably did too. He did. He did. I think, I think it's fair to say he did. You know, I, I, I think we, like we would have done things differently. Like, and part of that, frankly, is also time. Like, we had a majority in Congress for two years, and then we lost the House and never got it back. So really, we only had total freedom of action for two years. You know, and I often think, what would I have done differently? If I had known that we really were only going to have these majorities for two years, I, right? I would guess immigration would have been at the top. Immigration, yeah. Guantanamo, like, uh, you know, legislating some of the things we wanted to end up doing on climate change. It would have been hard to get all that done along with everything else we were doing at the time. But I do think that I would have had a greater appreciation for the limitations of that bipartisan message we had, the limitation of time that we had to really make big change. One of the things that's interesting to me is that you're at your maximum political capital on day one, and every day you're in office, you're, you're losing political capital, you know? <laughs> and then you replenish it a little bit if you're reelected, but it never goes back to what it was. So I think that urgency, I would have had more urgency, you know? And then I also think you just learn things about how the government operates, that if I'd known, you know, I was much more effective in the second term than the first, because I knew how to move the pieces around, and I knew how sure. to work the bureaucracy, and I knew, you know, how to get something done with Congress. And, and, and that kind of intangible knowledge, you know, that's what I didn't have as a 31-year-old. What I had, though, is that I wasn't jaded. You know, it's almost a good thing to have some people there who are still riding a wave of idealism. You need to kind of revitalize things because, you know, some of the people I've known who are great people but who've been around Washington for years, they internalize all of the compromises you have to make. You know? Sure. And, and so while I would have wanted to give that advice to younger Ben Rhodes, I think it's probably good that I also, I was that person who came in thinking about everything that was possible and not just the limitations we were going to face. Sure. That's really interesting. Back on episode 108, Alex dove into a new topic to Millennium Live, cryptocurrency. The chief executive officer of Unfederal Reserve joined the podcast to discuss his life, career journey, and instead of buying his video games, he started to make them. Howard Krieger. You know, I, I grew up in central Jersey in Berkeley Heights, which is a home to uh, Murray Hill where Bell Labs is. My father was lead QA tester for Unix, one of the first people as part of the Unix team. You know, I, I tried to describe it like this. You know, growing up, you'd go to Toys R Us and they had the video games. I don't know if you remember, if you wanted a video game at Toys R Us, you had to go get the little slip of paper and then you'd pay and bring it yes. to the front. Yes, right? I remember that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I would go at like every once in a while, my mom had to go get birthday presents for somebody and I'd always want the video games. And, you know, we were, we really didn't have the budget for it. So, you know, we'd go home and, and my dad would be like, why are you buying video games? He's like, just make them. And so, uh, <laughs> during the week, I think library day in elementary school was either Thursday or Friday. They'd have like Nintendo power magazine, which is like a short kind of flip through of all the cheats and stuff. But the back was always like a basic program. And, uh, you know, Saturday mornings, my sister, my older sister and I would be downstairs with our TRS-80 computer hooked up to a black and white monitor. And we would literally read lines of code to each other. And like normal kids are playing sports and stuff. And me and my sister are like programming our own video games. And by lunch, you know, we'd have like a dot bouncing on the screen or something. Uh, <laughs> but we were so excited, you know, like when it worked, it was great. And I grew up in this household but what was interesting was, you know, my father was the son of a butcher and my grandfather, like when you talk about toiling away, you know, the big hunks of meat, his own shop, he was his own businessman. And my, my, so my father grew up with his father being like, do something different. Don't do what I do, do something better, do something different. And my father, God bless, was like, you do the same thing, Hal, you know, just, just do your own thing. Don't, don't necessarily follow on what I'm doing. Sure. And you know, it just so happened that by the time I get to college, I tried my hand at like accounting and I liked economics, but I felt like a finance background would be more practical. And, and, you, uh, stayed, and you stayed in Jersey for college, right? You're a Rutgers grad? Rutgers for my MBA, but undergrad was uh, James Madison in oh, Virginia. Okay. okay, cool. And so, and that was kind of on a whim where one of my friends had that magazine on their coffee table and, and they were like, what college are you applying to? And I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, okay, well, this one looks good. So uh, it was it was tremendous. You know, I have to say that 
you know, regardless of anyone's kind of spiritual background, and, and I totally respect everyone's viewpoint on this, my life's truly been blessed. W- whether, you know, there's some kind of divine hand kind of guiding a lot of what's going on, or just setting the stage, mm-hmm. or allowing me to kind of maximize my potential without actually interfering. There's no way I could have gotten, I, I don't f- feel like I could have gotten here just by like picking a path and sticking to it. Sure. You know, as, my, as my grandmother said, you know, man plans and God laughs. So <laughs> I like that. It's not often that your wife calls you to tell you that you've been replaced in your role by the president of the United States. It's even more rare that she calls you to tell you that you've been replaced via tweet. Well, former secretary for U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs joined the podcast with Alex to discuss his career and notoriously getting fired by former President Trump. Please welcome David Shulkin. If you don't mind me asking, how, how did the end come about? Because it seemed like you had a good thing going there. Yeah, yeah. I always had a good open relationship with the president. On the day that I was fired, he had called me at around noon. We spoke on the phone for an hour, and it was a relatively normal conversation about updates about what we were going to get done. I told him during the next 90 days, I was going to give him three new policy initiatives that were going to make a big difference. He seemed to be pleased with that. He had some questions about it, but it was a normal conversation. At about six o'clock that evening, I was on the phone with my wife. I had just gotten home from the office and she's in Philadelphia. I'm in Washington. And she said to me, oh my God, I just got a tweet from the president. I never got his tweets, but she she did. And she said, you've been replaced by his personal doctor, Ronnie Jackson. And so that's the way I found out about it. This was the turmoil that you would see in the Trump administration, wow. which is that somebody had a discussion with the president between, you know, one o'clock when I hung up the phone with him and six o'clock when he tweeted me out that must have said, you know, Mr. President, this guy, and I have no knowledge of this. I'm just imagining what the conversation would be. But, you know, this is, this guy really is an Obama guy. He's not Mm -hmm. in line with you. You need to have somebody who is more philosophically in line or whatever it is. And the president was convinced that this was the right thing to do. The big issue of tension that I had with the administration, not as much, you know, in terms of direct conflict with the president, but the president's people was over privatizing the VA. And I simply was not willing to do that. And I knew I was putting my job on the line. And, um, You know, I told my family every day, you know, you serve at the pleasure of the president. This may be my last day. And I was okay with that. You know, that that's part of what you have to do if you're going to stand up and be principle based and be willing to stand up for what you believe in. We've had quite a few guests join our podcast to reimagine healthcare delivery, focusing on quality care that patients expect and disrupting a fragmented system and drive transformation. What's it going to take, you ask? Well, let's ask Dr. Stephen Klasko, the former president of Thomas Jefferson University and former CEO of Jefferson Health. You know, one of my mentors at Wharton was a guy named Bill Kissick. Dr. Kissick wrote a book like, literally like 35 years ago called Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. And if at a cocktail party, you want an honest and non-political way of looking at this, he said, look, there's an iron triangle of access, quality, and cost. And if you remember your isosceles triangle, you increase one angle, you got to decrease another. <laughs> Ninth grade geometry. I didn't do great geometry, but yeah. If you increase access, you either have to increase cost or decrease quality, et cetera, et cetera. Unless you're willing to disrupt the system, and disruption is painful. So literally in the early 90s, he said, if anybody ever tells you they're going to increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it's not going to be painful, they're not telling the truth. So if you think about the Affordable Care Act, President Obama said, good news, the ACA will increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it won't be painful. That's a quote. So that can't be true. President Trump, I think, said his plan will be fantastic, terrific, unbelievable, and really huge, and it was none of the four. So at the end of the day, the objective thing is that that every one of our health policies, including the ACA for the last 12 years, says, how do we give more people access to a fundamentally broken, fragmented, expensive, inequitable, and occasionally unsafe healthcare delivery system and hope the healthcare delivery system will transform. But we don't want to do any of the hard stuff to get it to transform. Why? Because that will upset the pharma lobby. 
That will upset the insurance lobby. That will upset the hospital lobby. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to, so if you just think about this logically, Alex, and if anybody listening thinks about it, in every other industry that, that disrupted and said, all right, we're going to give everybody access. We're going to move a dollar and a quarter of healthcare to a dollar. What are the first stocks you would have sold? You would have sold insurance stocks because in essence, they're the, very often the middle people, right? Sure. They get 17 cents on the dollar. You would have maybe sold your supply chain stocks because cost for supplies, pharma has to go down. Well, you probably know this, but other than maybe Apple and Amazon, for-profit insurance stocks were the best stock you could get since the ACA. I mean, they've sure. gone up by 11 or 12 times. Pharma stocks have gone up eight or nine times. So how can your supply and your middlemen expand to that level give everybody access and still decrease costs. You can't. And you mentioned Senator Sanders. I think the pandemic has proven that Senator Sanders was 100% right about the problem. He said, we have this corporate-driven, sick care-driven, hospital-driven, insurance-driven thing that doesn't work for people. I think the pandemic has proven that, right? I mean, your number one reason to die uh, or get hospitalized for COVID had nothing to do with masks, social distancing, or your genetic code. It was your zip code. Because frankly, if you don't have connectivity, then, then you, you weren't able to participate in telehealth or online education. In addition to location, yeah. how much of do you think was the fact that a majority of Americans are just unhealthy? And personally, I'm interested in is obviously location plays a role in act, and connectivity and accessibility plays a role. But how much of the fact that you have so many people in America that either have no access to healthcare because they don't have insurance or they have insurance, they don't know how to use it or they don't know where to go. And therefore they're not getting checked out. There's no pre preventive care. How much did the pandemic expose the fact that people were just generally too unhealthy to begin with? Yeah, well, I think that's true, but 80%, look, 80% of healthcare is what we spend about 10% on. I mean, it's food, education, housing, right? So, I mean, you know, a lot of my passion is around technology and, and, and social determinants. Food deserts are a good example, right? Yeah. So where I live, I can walk to like a Trader Joe's and a Whole Foods. In certain zip codes in Philadelphia, the only place you can walk to is a place that sells chips and sodas, okay? A bodega. All right. Or Pats so, and Jimmy's. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so, but think about this. I mean, but we now have drone delivery. So what if you had enlightened healthcare policy, which said, Mrs. Jones, you're on government um, food support. If you're willing to serve your family healthy food, we'll give you 40% more government food support. And we'll drone deliver it or, or once the car. Well, that would, that would have a huge impact on childhood obesity and, and healthcare. So Ken Frazier, the CEO of Merck, just gave Jefferson um, $5 million to create the Stroke Prevention Center where he grew up in 18th and Tioga. The fact is, you know, he's, a, he's an African-American man, but an African-American man when he grew up has a 15 times chance of getting a stroke than an African-American man where, you know, where, where he lives now. So it's, there's nothing about that location. There's nothing about the genetics. It's about the food. It's about the education. It's about the housing. And we don't spend any money on that. You know, so we, we spend a lot of money on, you know, giving money to hospitals and insurance companies, et cetera. So what, what I have really advocated for with the, with the Biden-Harris team is we need a 9-11 commission for healthcare. I mean, if you could just imagine, you know, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell getting up no different than what happened after 9-11 and the Democrats blamed the Republicans, the Republicans blamed the Democrats. But at yeah. some point, a Democratic senator, a Republican senator got up and said, we failed to keep the country safe. We're going to create this commission under the radar for six months. What if you had McConnell and Schumer get up and say, you know what? We have failed to solve health care in this country. We're the only country that still does not provide access, where people have to you know, mortgage their, their houses for cancer care. We're, we have the largest healthcare discrepancies by zip code of, 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 of almost any other country. In my specialty, the maternal, the maternal morbidity and neonatal morbidity rate is somewhere about number 20 or 21 in the world, but we wow. spend three to four times as much per obstetric patient than anybody in the world. So we failed. Let's create a 9-11 commission, you know, bring folks together and look at how we can redo the system. I don't think Medicare for all is the answer for the simple re All you have to do is look at vaccine distribution. Yeah. <laughs> you want to leave it to the federal, state, and counties to get together and, and, and run healthcare when they can't even figure out who they're going to give vaccines to? I don't think that that's what any of us want. It won't surprise you to find our guests talking about how they grew up and how their parents or early mentors influenced their life and the decisions they made. A healthcare innovator who saw firsthand as a young boy the underserved communities of Chicago that he was going to set out on a mission for health equity and conquer the social determinants of health. Dr. J. Bott. What was starting to come to mind as, you know, you kind of were a young adolescent trying to figure out what you were going to do? What, what were you seeing that kind of inspired you to go, to go the route that you did? 
Thanks, Alex, for that. And I, you know, I would say that the introduction uh, was you you shared was very kind and generous. And uh, my mom would, uh, you know, <laughs> here right now she's smiling if she hears that. Um, and I think that South Asians also take a lot of pride in in kind of education and being sure. role models for you know their children. And so for me, it it was when I was ten. I was um, spending a lot of time with my dad and his pharmacies. So he you know worked retail, worked hospital worked also as he had his own pharmacy where, you know, it was a, it was like the United Nations in that, in, in that small five room clinic where you had people from all different backgrounds working together to improve the health of a community. And, and I thought that struck me, you know, around not too far from Comiskey Park where the Sox play. Mm -hmm. Those communities were ones uh, extending all the way down, you know, to the edge of the south side of the city where we would travel after work and deliver medications to people, have conversations, you know, and see them vulnerable. Um, you know, they couldn't come to the clinic because they didn't have bus fare or there were five other things that were more of a priority than their health, uh, whether it was food on the table, their children's school, mental health challenges, lack of jobs, any, anything and, and everything that could have impacted their life that took them away from health uh, and that prioritizing that could have sort of happened. And I, and I saw that uh, family challenges, losing loved ones. But then there was also people that would walk outside their door and it would be so cold that the asthma would flare out and, and they couldn't move and couldn't get to the clinic. And so for a lot of those situations, we went to people's homes and saw, you know, I remember walking up the stairs of a, a half boarded apartment building on the south side and and with my dad and as you walk up each of those stairs it creaks and i'm like uh, i may just fall through i mean also the conditions were challenging in some of these places and and you see how vulnerable and how challenged people's lives are in it and it really just i think struck me and i felt like my dad was superman running around the city with a cape you know helping these people and i there were times where i'd say i just want to go home and mom's like got great you know food i want to go like I got sure. this to do, want to hang out with my friend. So I think early on that really left an imprint. And then as I spent more time with him in these communities and then with others, and I volunteered at Oak Forest Hospital when I was in high school and, and got exposure, I learned a lot just by kind of observation is that I think the notion that our healthcare system was failing our people that needed it the most. And so when we think about accessible, affordable, high quality, equitable healthcare in this country, that was not the reality for, I think, where we want to be. If we, we spend so much on healthcare in this country, but there's a mismatch, more medical spending than social spending. If you look at all the developed countries in the world and the data and where we stand on the WHO rankings, we're in the 40s in terms of health. We should be much higher than that given the amount of money we're spending on healthcare. And so if you look at the developed countries, they have a flip on their spending. It's around social uh, and services and communities is more than direct medical care. And we know now through more and more evidence, and it's become mainstream that the social needs, economic challenges, environmental influences, essentially your zip code has more an impact on your health than your genetic code. Do you think that's because other countries are prioritizing preventive care at a much higher level than the United States is? You know, I think it's not as simple as that. I think it's part of the story. It's part of the idea that you've got to help people be educated, supported, and make the easy thing the right the right thing the easy thing to do and so spending certainly and incentives around prevention are stronger that's also they're thinking about what are the wraparound needs people might have and some of the dollars that are spent on that will go to whether it's transportation housing food insecurity you know those issues that make it hard to live have you live a healthy life or jobs and you know, we know that on average if you have unstable housing, your life expectancy is about 27 years less than someone that does have stable housing. Housing is health, right? And so if we're not going to help think about that in some communities and, and address it, then you're going to have higher utilization of the healthcare system and more costly utilization of it. So I think it's also an orientation and me mentality, at, you know, in certain certain countries around health. And this notion, I think, a crux of health as a human right or health as a commodity. You know, I think yes. we made the decision that it's a commodity, whereas other countries have really moved towards the spectrum of health as a human right. And I think we're hearing and President Biden actually uh, in his address recently articulated that, that, that I think you know, we got to move to health as a human right. And, and that's, you know, I think some of the effort that was done in the Obama administration and has been done in other attempts in other presidents' administrations to try to think about how do we get people 
coverage, but then once you have coverage, help them understand how to use that coverage. The Millennium Live podcast has been extremely fortunate to have some of the most passionate entrepreneurs, storytellers, and leaders to tell their stories right here. One of our favorite guests and episodes, former Chief Information Officer and Interim Chief Data Officer of HHS, Jose Arrieta, who talks about the moments that led to his decision to work in D.C. So I wanted to be a grad assistant uh, basketball coach, and then I wanted to be an athletic director. That was my goal. And I knew that I could go to graduate school for free if I was a, if I was a GA. And I was very good at the game. And in fact, I coached later on in my life when I was what, in What Washington. position did you play? Three, four, five. It really depended on the, the need of the team. But, you know, I could handle the ball. I could shoot. And I had good footwork. So I could play any of those positions. I, I don't think I was quick enough to play any other positions. But sure. Yeah. So I, that was my goal. And so, you know, the first couple of years, I, I started a bit as a freshman. You know, I, I almost transferred. I, I left the team and came back. You know, it was a, it's tough when you're... I was very close with my mom and my grandmother. My grandmother had a huge impact on my life. She passed away right before I went to college. So anyway, I, you know, I committed fully to basketball my junior year. I lived there. I ran every morning, lifted weights every day, you know, did a thousand shots in the morning, you know, before school actually started once the, once the fall semester started and, and 9-11 happened. So I was in the gym on 9-11, you know, at the end of this two hour workout, we do this drill where point guard who I worked out with would shoot the ball. He'd make it or miss it. I'd get the rebound, outlet it to him. And I'd have run down the court. He'd lob the ball out in front, catch it one dribble and try to dunk it. And you do 10 of those. And, and like, you're never going to do 10 dunks. Like you're just, you're dog tired. The idea is to just kill your body, just wear yourself out. Right in the middle of that drill coach came in and said, Hey, a plane, you know, hit the world trade center. And I thought it was just like a little Cessna. In fact, I lived with my uncle uh, for a period of time when I was younger and he taught me how to fly. So we didn't even have TV. You know, I, I lived with a football player. We didn't even have television. We were like committed, you know, so I, I left, we, I ended up buying TV. I, I had a job uh, on the weekends at U-Haul and I started re- reading about terrorism finance. And, you know, I just, I had a mentor in, in college named uh, Dr. Bill Ward, who worked for a couple different, different presidents and was a Marine and, uh, and like, was actually a part, he was actually a soldier in the movie. We were soldiers once and young. And I said to him, like, hey, man, I I think I'm going to move to Washington, D.C. Because I couldn't get into the military. I I had some um, I have some medical challenges where they won't let me in. And so I want to go and I want to be a part of this. Right. And so I kind of just made up my mind that I'm going to move to Washington, D.C. It was my junior year. Didn't really have a plan. A couple months before graduating, I just called a buddy that I knew had a job in D.C. And I said, look, I'm going to move there. Can you get me an interview at the company you're working at? Uh, I think I can do some sales. Uh, And he said, yeah. Uh, and I drove down, you know, I had my stuff in the car. Uh, I did the interview. Uh, and the reason I wanted to work there is because I knew they provided like a really low cost, like living space for like the first six months. I, I it was a really nice section of Old Town Alexandria. And they said, when can you start? And I said, tomorrow. And I was like, hey, do, you, do y'all have like a place to live? And they're like, actually, like our, our smallest studio just opened up like last week and nobody rented it. Do you want it? And I said, yep. Walked in. Uh, set my clothes down. And I realized like, I didn't bring hangers. I didn't bring plates. I didn't bring pans and I didn't bring a bed. I had a PlayStation, uh, the movie Black Hawk Down and a TV. And I just kind of slept on the floor and I, I started work the next day. Like, so that that's literally how I ended up uh, in DC. And it was primarily driven by 9-11. Watching those people fall out of the buildings was, you know, pretty impactful and I just thought, you know, there has to be something that I can do that, you know, will positively benefit the country. And so I, I basically just changed my plan and moved to D.C. after that event. It wasn't necessarily about your first job in D.C. being a job ultimately that would be public service. But it sounds like you knew that if you just got to D.C. And- well, I had read an article in the Wall Street Journal. I started reading uh, the Wall Street Journal and I had read an article that uh, the U.S. federal government was you know, trying to connect with people and bring in new people by offering free graduate school. And so I thought, well, first move there uh, and then, you know, just meet people to see what happens. Um, And so while I was in the job, I actually uh, met a woman and she's like, you know, you'd be perfect uh, to work with us at GSA. Uh, We we pay for grad school. Don't tell them that in the interview. 
<laughs> and uh, and I went to the interview and and they offered me two jobs. Uh, and one of them was a job kind of GSA has like a business function where they service other agencies. So it's kind of like a sales function. Uh, and the other one was a contracting job. And, and the recruiter, I'll never forget, his name was Roger Kraus. I'll never forget this. He called me. I was, I was in Florida. I had taken a little vacation. And he told me, he offered me the one job. He calls me a few hours later. He's like, you're not going to believe this, but you got the other one. I said, well, what should I do? He goes, well, you're going to hate the contracting job um, because you're an ex, you know, you're more extroverted. You're going to hate it. But he's like, if you do that, if you can tough it out for a few years, government is really controlled by federal procurement. And, and I'm telling you, you're going to hate it. It's very detail oriented, but you know, that's the one that's going to give you the ability to kind of move up. So I took it. He was right. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I tried to leave multiple times. And there was a, I had a mentor named Houston Taylor, who's still an executive in government. And he used to tell me, just stick with it. We don't have a lot of folks uh, like that have like your, your uh, skill set, meaning like that can like is extroverted and can kind of like talk about these things, like off the top of his head, it's going to take six years, but once you learn it, you're going to be able to really change things. And every time I was trying to move on, maybe make more money, he would convince me to stay. Uh, at the same time, they started paying for my graduate school. They they asked me if I wanted to go and I applied and started to go to American University, which I really enjoyed. But I also uh, met a guy, you know, randomly in the building I lived in. He was sweating. He was tall. The sticker on the car outside said Susquehanna University. So I asked him like, hey, you playing ball and uh, where, you know, do you, did you go to Susquehanna University? And he's like, my girlfriend is so-and-so who I knew yeah, because I went to school with her and I'm not actually playing basketball. Um, I'm actually coaching it. I played at Georgetown, but I actually coach a team now. Do you want a team? And uh, I was like, well, I'm going to grad school. I'll be the assistant coach. And I have a roommate that I know would coach. I played a uh, high school ball with it that also played college ball. Um, and I started kind of coaching this team. And, you know, we were getting beat 72 to two or something once. And I just, couldn't take, I just couldn't, it was a travel AAU team. I just couldn't take it anymore. And I just called a timeout. And then for the next four years, I coached a basketball team that played, you know, uh, two, two days a week, uh, three weekends a month and, and traveled the U S and we ended up, you know, we won tournaments. We first, we scored more than 10, then we won a game, then we won a tournament, then we competed in nationals. You know, my best player uh, actually played at Cornell Wow. Uh, that the, the mom of my best play with well, the mom of one of my very good players was actually involved in the operation warp speed and the development of the, of the vaccine itself. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, worked directly for Fauci under the, the, his chief medical advisor. So when kind of the, some things hit the fan, there was a very personal relationship there. I had coached uh, her child since maybe eight years old. I had written a book for these kids on the fundamentals of basketball. Like it wasn't anything fancy, but it was a book, right? On the fundamentals I was trying to teach, you know, I probably would have left government service, but the team itself is really kind of what binded me into like this whole idea of sticking with government that between the team and, and grad school. And then that got me through like the, the years where you're just learning like the simple things that are maybe a little bit less exciting uh, and once you get through like four or five years and you can start to see the impact that you can have uh, as a civil servant, uh, it becomes addicting, right? It's almost like having another drink. Like it, it's tough to, it's tough to say no. And th that's kind of what kind of kept me in, in, in federal service. In March of 2020, business as we know it changed virtually overnight. And this was no different for a coffeehouse brand like Starbucks. Millennium Live had our 2021 Digital Enterprise Innovator of the Year Jerry Martin Flickinger, the CTO at Starbucks, to discuss the changes that Starbucks had to make to continue their passion for the human connection. Well, it's certainly interesting. You know, many people probably don't realize everything that goes on behind the scenes for them to have that experience. Yeah. We're certainly uh, kind of the, the wizard behind the curtain making a lot of that happen. So since we are here to discuss your achievement of Millennium Lions Innovator of the Year, what was the big, one of the biggest challenges that Starbucks faced during the pandemic? Because you know, I know obviously most companies face one unique challenge or another. Yeah, well, I think we probably just faced the same types of challenges everyone else faced. And some of them we managed through brilliantly and other ones we sort of learned as we went. You know, I think the first thing that all of us faced was having 100% work from home. And we have not been back at our corporate offices since. 
the resiliency that we've seen from our partners, their ability to continue to deliver and innovate has been truly inspirational. I don't know that we've done anything particularly unique, but I do want to share a few stories that I think really showed our culture coming through during the pandemic. And I'm not sure this is technology innovation at all, but it is about human connection. One of the things at Starbucks that is very core to our, our values is, of course, coffee and coffee knowledge and coffee quality. So we start many of our meetings with a coffee tasting, much like you would have a wine tasting. You will sample a cup of coffee and someone will describe the flavors, the origin of the coffee, many times some really interesting facts about um, how we harvest it or how we process the coffee. Unfortunately, when pandemic happens, it's kind of hard to bring people together and have a coffee tasting, but we didn't let that tradition go. So, for example, every time we would have a new cohort of new technology partners, I would lead a 12-week coffee academy tasting with those new partners, and we would get on a Teams call, uh, much like this, and we would taste coffee together and talk about coffee every single week. It was about a 20-minute coffee tasting, and it was there to continue to instill the culture of coffee, even if we couldn't be in the same room. And, you know, at first it felt a little awkward, but it was quite amazing how quickly we could adapt and have those same kind of human connections, even without being in the same room. Now, I say all of that, and, and you asked me a question about innovator of the year. And, and sometimes being an innovator in technology is making sure the technology just works so it doesn't get in the way of people connecting. And we were fortunate enough and had a tremendous team in technology that literally overnight took a culture that was 100% in-person workforce and turned them into a 100% remote workforce without dropping a beat. It was phenomenal. I would say that Starbucks as a culture before the pandemic, we did not have a culture of video meetings. We just didn't. We didn't have a culture of dialing people into meetings. It wasn't part of our coffee house culture. Our culture was about person to person. So I think part of innovating sometimes isn't about the new shiny object. It's about making sure that technology works seamlessly. Now, we also did some shiny object things, of course, at the same time. Everything from more intelligence and more personalization on our applications, um, more work around data and machine learning to automate and optimize our store production, machine learning around labor scheduling to try to help optimize and ensure we had enough partners and baristas in stores where we needed them, and a tremendous amount of AI along our supply chain because individual component parts became scarce in the broader U.S. supply chain. We had to adjust really rapidly for that in our stores. So lots of shiny object things. I would say the most important thing during the pandemic has been, though, how do you maintain the seamless human interaction? If we learned anything about Barry Klarberg in his episode, it's that he's got so many great stories to share. Barry's a professional business and wealth manager for athletes, entertainers, and high net worth individuals. And on this episode, we explored growing up in Rockaway, Queens, and always being ahead in his academics, life lessons shared by his parents. My success today is because of the work that I had to put in, you know, when I was in the Rockaways, and, and it was hard work and dedication in terms of school. And then I had a mo mother and father who are loving, caring parents who directed me into different decisions in my life at the time. And if I go back, my dad was 50 when I was born. My mom was 44. So I was, okay. I was a change of, well, my sister who is 20 years older than me says I was a mistake or not planned. <laughs> I, I almost look at it as like I was a gift to my parents who, who had some concepts of what to do with me at, at the time and all. And they, they, listen, they always promoted to me to work hard at school. I always had, I had a job since I was 13 years old. They didn't overplay the job. It was important for me to work. I did it for my spending money, but I didn't do it necessarily to, I didn't have to do it on a daily basis. My parents were more of the studies come first and your education comes first. And if you want to work up a couple of days a week, I worked at a catering hall, you know, bussing tables and then bartending and then waitering and the whole bed and working in the kitchen and all. So I had pretty good food experience, let's say. But and then today, my, my biggest passion today is cooking. I enjoy cooking. You'll find me cooking at any downtime I have. And for me, it frees up my mind. And, and I'll explain how all that works. So, but if I go back to the Rockaways and all, 
I think one of the things my parents always did for me, my, especially my dad, is that he always pushed me. He, he, he pushed me to the next level at a really early age. And, and it was interesting. I started kindergarten at five years old, where most kids start at six years old. So it was a year, a year ahead. And I was educationally, um, I was able to keep up with the kids in my class. And I was always advanced and all in terms of, let's say, call it education or, or, or and it wasn't until I got to, I got to high school and I was an athlete, a- athlete as well. I played my, probably baseball was my sport growing up and all, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I remember um, trying out for the high school baseball team and there was no JV. I was, I went to a place called beach channel and there was no JV and I played first base and there was 22 kids who, who tried out for first base. There was 4,000 kids in the, uh, in the school. And uh, if you understand the Rockaways, it's a melting pot of Irish, Jewish, and, and African American, and and Spanish, and and everybody went to school together. But you know, at the end of the day, you got your clique or you got your group, and you went with it and all. But it was in high school that my father saw me. I'm not saying spinning out of control, but you know, I took all the classes I need to cl- take and. Uh, he said, you're going out, you know, you were like on weekends, I would go out and, and enjoy myself, a party and all. And he grabbed me and he said, listen, it's time for you to make some decisions in your life of what's important and all. And I said, dad, I'm, I'm 15 years old. I don't know what decisions I can make. And he said, well, what college do you want to go to? And I said, I, I haven't figured that one out yet. And he turned to me at 15 and he said, listen, I took your high school transcript and I sent it to two universities for you. And I said, what two universities? He goes, St. John's and Pace University. And I said, well, why do you, what, what's the plan there? What's your thoughts? And, and I was open to everything. And he goes, Pace said they'll take you at 15. And we don't care if you have a high school diploma or not. And you can go to Pace University as a full-time. Around, around what year was this? This was 1977. Okay. It was not, not too long ago, but 1977, I was 15 going on 16. And I got accepted by Pace University in St. John's for an early admission program. And what that meant was I started college classes immediately, a full-time matriculating student. I didn't have a high school degree. And I took my freshman year credits in English and applied it back and got an equivalency diploma. I, I just am curious because your, your dad seemed very focused on making sure that you were on the right track. Interesting move to try to get you into college or taking college courses years before most people are ready. What do you think the motivation was for that? How, what, what gave him that idea? He saw he saw the New York City school system as limited for a person like myself. He saw it as not being wasn't being challenged enough. You know, by the age of fifteen, I had taken all the classes I needed to take, other than gym and English, to graduate. And and what he saw was he saw me drifting a little, and and you know, not in my study. I didn't have to study. I mean, that was the thing. At the age of fifteen, it was just like you know, I can go to class. I can not float by. I could, you know, I was getting A's. And putting in middle, minimal effort. And I don't think he saw that as education. And I think in his own regard, you know, previous to the, you know, me being born, he was in medical school and he was in the New York City six year program, which meant that you had six years, you got your undergraduate degree and your medical degree in, in, in this CUNY medical program and all. Sure. In three or four, three, in three years into it, um, his dad had passed away and he had to take over the family business which was a bakery supply business. And he left school to do that. And I think there was a part of him that was upset with that or upset with himself that he never achieved the things that he wanted to achieve as an individual. And the business, you know, eventually drifted away, you know, the the market that he was in. Mom was this um, stay at home mom, typically providing me safety, love and caring, make sure I did my homework. You know, she was, you know, a stickler on that, a soft-spoken woman. My dad was more, this is how it's going to get done. And my mom was more of the calm influence in my life at the time. We all have inspirations and mentors that have guided our decision-making throughout our career. Karen Hold, the CEO and founder of Experience Labs, talks about Grandpa Grumman. I want to know maybe more about who your mentors were and maybe some inspirations that have guided you and your journey throughout your career and where you see it going in the future. 
one of my biggest influences is someone that I actually didn't even meet. My husband's grandfather was Leroy Grumman, who founded Grumman Aerospace. I, we got married in 1990. So I started learning this language of design sort of in the background. I started absorbing, it's almost like a different language of communication. My dad was a lawyer. And so he used a, a verbal language to communicate. And when I married into the Grumman family, the family used a visual language to communicate. That's one that I had not been exposed to in my childhood. I had not even been exposed to that in my formal education. And I learned how successful Grandpa Grumman was using a visual language to communicate. He was very shy. He was yeah. a man of very few words. And so one of my favorite stories about him is that, so it's World War II, we're losing the war in the Pacific. And the Secretary of the Navy came to Grandpa and asked him how we could double the number of aircraft on aircraft carriers because we needed more planes in the air in the South Pacific. So the obvious answer was to fold the wings of the planes up because they would take less space to store. And a lot of naval aviators had tried to do that, but with poor results because the wings were snapping off. And so test pilots were going into the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean trying to figure this out. And Grandpa's sitting around a table of his best engineers. There are about 30 engineers at this long conference table, and, and they're all sharing their knowledge on the subject. And Grandpa's sitting at the end of the table, just tinkering with an eraser and two paper clips. <laughs> Paying attention, right? But he's he's absorbing everything that his engineers are telling him. He's not contributing a word to the conversation, but he's absorbing and he's tinkering. They come around to grandpa and he puts this eraser and two paper clips on the table and everybody instantly knew that he had solved this problem. What he had been able to do was to figure out that the problem was the problem of a pivot just with these paper clips and this eraser. And if you could fold the wing back on the plane, like the wing of a bird, then you could maintain the stability, but you can also achieve the space saving that you needed by folding it back on itself. They instantly knew when they saw this visual artifact, which was just, you know, a cheap eraser and, and some paper clips, <laughs> like stuff that's just sitting around the office, right? Of course. That simple prototype, which they still have, and they still, they have like a little museum area up at, up at Grumman in Long Island. So they took it to the model maker and the, and the, the company, the firm's model maker made like a proper model that they could take down to the secretary of the Navy and, and grandpa put it on the desk and, and the secretary of the Navy instantly knew what this meant with this simple model, right? So there are not a lot of words being exchanged, but he was using this visual language to communicate and have better conversations that words were not achieving. That wing design came to be known as the Stowe wing. And that wing design went on the Hellcat and the Avenger, which were really important planes for us in the war in the Pacific and, and helped us win that war. And he, he's really my design hero because I learned so much about the value of prototyping, about having better conversations by making things concrete instead of keeping them abstract. I learned so much about iteration and how to keep revising your plans until you get to a better place. I learned so much about empathetic leadership because during the war, most of his employees were women because their husbands were off on the war front. They had never worked before and he would walk the shop floor and discovered that they needed more support. He created a diaper delivery service before the, that was even available. <laughs> <laughs> It created, you know, childcare services at the plant so that women had a place to take their babies. He had a little green truck that would, would go and meet people if they're, if they had a flat tire or they left their oven on or, or something, but he really met his employees where they 
where they were and treated them as family with an empathy that I think is so extraordinary for a leader like him. You know, he was the largest yeah. employer in Long Island during the war, something like 45,000 employees. That's um, unbelievable. During the war. Yeah. The spirit of empathy, invention, and iteration, which I think are the key principles of design. He was really my inspiration and, and has, has really been my design hero. On last week's episode, Alex interviewed two guests and had a remarkable conversation with Alex Putri and Ryan Fabian, the managing partners at Terraform Capital. They chatted about their backgrounds and where they grew up, and the story of how they became friends and brought their respective backgrounds together. Here, Michael talks about his really horrible year in 2019, being sick, and an outcome that could have been extremely different. Mike, I, I know a big part of your life is you, you were sick for about a year. If you wouldn't mind, what was that year like for you? Because you had accomplished so much up until around that time period. What your thoughts were when you were sick about what your life was going to be like coming out of it? And wh around what year was that? And where, what phase were you at in your life when all that happened? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was recently. It was 2019. So I, we'd started the crypto company in the beginning of uh, 2017, took it public in June. By December of that year is when all the fanfare came out and some of the stuff that, you know, where I was, uh, the Wall Street Journal had me on the cover twice in a month in December of 2017. And uh, they had listed me because we had taken the crypto company public to demonstrate that you could be in the crypto space and be a good corporate citizen. And we also wanted to espouse and evangelize the cryptocurrency world and the world of blockchain by taking this company public and giving the SEC the opportunity to review documents, financials in the manner and structure which they're accustomed to reviewing things, form of 10Ks, 8Ks, views, whatnot. But as such, when that frenzy was going on during 2017, when they were, you know, when the world really first got hungry for Bitcoin on a very large scale, we took the company public at a $30 million valuation and Within four months, the the stock went from three to six hundred. It was oh, wow. it was insane. But in and again, I'm a as you mentioned before, I'm more of a corporate finance uh, and an investment banking person, and I'm running a publicly traded technology company. But kind of taking the long way around to answer your question, but it, I think it uh, it's pertinent. So when I, we got the company to a certain level, it was always forecasted that I was going to step down as CEO because we we're going to bring in uh, you know an executive that was more suited towards uh, running a technology company. I just had experience because I'd run two other prior publicly traded companies. So I'd had a lot of experience in the space, was able to guide the company through their initial throws as a public company. And then in the middle of 2018, in May of 2018, I had stepped down and it honestly effectively retired. It was, I was still close to being a billionaire at the time of where the stock was. And that fall, and it, Ryan had, was working uh, with the crypto company at that time. And that fall, he and I had spoke and I had talked to him about starting Terraform. And we were set to, we were going to be launching Terraform on January of 2019. And January 9th of 2019, I, I dropped. Uh, it was a young person to get a very bad case of diverticulitis, which is an erosion of the lining in your large intestine. Mm. And so my large intestine literally fell apart uh, inside me. And the pain was excruciating. <laughs> it was, there were no signs of this before this, this incident? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, it was just, it just came on and all of a sudden I was rolling on the floor screaming. My girlfriend at the time called uh, 911 and uh, there I was in the hospital and I was literally for a year unconscious or sedated. I had five surgeries. Uh, oh my God. I slipped stem to stern five times on my second surgery. I actually coded and died. I had the, the full round trip experience. So I went to the other side, was given actually the opportunity to stay or come back. And, uh, you know, I have children, so I chose to uh, come back and I'm very glad that I did, but it was, uh, it was a brutal year. I mean, just imagine disappearing for a year, you know, just boop, blip, gone. How, how rare in, is this in terms of percentages? I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's it's been explained to me that diverticulitis is not uncommon, but it is uncommon for somebody as young as me, even though I was 48 at the time. And it, it was an interesting coincidence because my father passed away at 48 also. So, uh, But it was, yeah, it was a brutal, brutal year. I I was a shell of a human being when I was in the hospital. I uh, I looked like a skeleton and it was a long rehab. And even after I got out of the hospital, it was, well, it took us, you know, I got out of the hospital and I finished everything really at the end of 2018, but sorry, you know, 2019, but we didn't launch the fund until Q3 of 2020. So that it really took me a long time just to get my focus and my head back and 
it was the toughest thing I've ever had to go through. Wow. I didn't know the detail that I, I knew that you were sick, but I, I didn't know to the, to the extent of what, and I didn't realize that Terraform, the idea for it was before you actually got sick. So mm -hmm. you coming out of that was fulfilling the idea and the plan that you had put together with Ryan previously. Yeah. And to his credit, Ryan actually waited for me. It was, um, I'll always be grateful for that because Ryan, as you can tell, he's an extremely talented individual. And yep. He had, uh, I think, quite a bit of opportunity in front of him. We had a deal and an agreement, and he held his end. So it was, it was worth fighting for, and it's it's been a great fight. I mean, but we've built something that we're very, very proud of. Well, it's part of what drew me to you guys. Thanks for listening, and be on the lookout for more episodes by Alex. In the meantime, subscribe to Millennium Live to listen and learn on life and leadership.